Welcome to the first in a series of videos focusing on the respiratory system and major topics in pulmonary mechanics. This video will focus on providing an overview of respiratory anatomy. By the end of this video, you should be able to identify the major components of the respiratory system, categorize the respiratory system as a series of discrete functional units, and describe how the different respiratory zones work together. These are the major components of the respiratory system. They can be divided into a number of different anatomic and functional categories, but for our purposes today, we will start from the top and work our way down and gradually out, beginning with the upper airway. This section includes, among other things, the nasopharynx, oropharynx, tongue, posterior pharynx, epiglottis, and trachea. The upper airway has many important functions, including warming, humidifying, and filtering incoming air, these will be covered in greater detail in a later video. Next, we move down past the trachea and into the first part of the lower airway and the lungs. The right lung has three lobes, named the upper, middle, and lower lobes. These lobes are separated by the horizontal and oblique fissures. The left lung is composed of two lobes and one oblique fissure. It also contains the lingula, which in some ways acts as a left middle lobe. The trachea splits at the carina into the right and left main bronchi. The right bronchus is further divided into the superior lobar or eparterial bronchus and intermediate bronchus, then into the middle and inferior lobar bronchi. The left main bronchus divides into superior and inferior lobar bronchi. The superior lobar bronchus then divides into the superior division bronchus and the lingular bronchus. From there, the bronchi can be divided into bronchopulmonary segments. These segments are each supplied by their own branch of the pulmonary artery, and therefore each segment is a discrete unit which can be surgically resected, if need be, without affecting its neighboring segments. The right upper lobe has three segments, apical, posterior, and anterior. The right middle lobe has two segments, lateral and medial. The right lower lobe has the most, with five segments superior, medial basal, anterior basal, lateral basal, and posterior basal. The left lung also has 10 bronchopulmonary segments. The left upper lobe claims both an apico-posterior and an anterior bronchopulmonary segment. The lingula has the superior and inferior lingular segments. The left lower lobe has the superior anteromedial lateral and posterior basal segments. As we travel further and further down the segmental bronchi, the airways continue to divide. The first five divisions are referred to as the large intrasegmental bronchi. The next 15 divisions are referred to as the small intrasegmental bronchi. As the small intrasegmental bronchi divide further, cartilages become less frequent until they no longer make up a part of the airway wall. This marks the division between the bronchi and the bronchioles and the divide between the conducting zone and the respiratory zone. The bronchioles further divide until they form terminal and respiratory bronchioles, finally culminating in alveolar sacs. It is important to understand the difference between these two functional zones of the respiratory system. The structures which make up the conducting zone are responsible for bringing air to gas exchanging regions of the lung, while those in the respiratory zone are responsible for diffusion of oxygen and carbon dioxide. The conducting zone includes the structures from the trachea distal to the terminal bronchioles. It is also responsible for the anatomic dead space, or airways which are ventilated but not perfused. The respiratory zone, in contrast, contributes very little to the anatomic dead space, and encompasses the largest portion of the total lung volume. It is also important to note that the conducting zone is the primary source of airway resistance for the respiratory system as a whole. Bronchioles further divide until they form terminal bronchioles, the smallest diameter airways which contain smooth muscle in their airway walls. These terminal bronchioles divide into respiratory bronchioles, which then divide until finally forming the alveoli and alveolar sacs. The distribution of alveoli is not uniform over the entirety of the lung. 
Approximately 50% of the lung's alveoli are located in the outer 30% of the lung radius, which is why on chest x-ray, the peripheral portion of the lung appears relatively empty. Collectively, the entire structure distal from the terminal bronchiole to the alveoli is referred to as a secondary pulmonary lobule, and it is the functional unit of the lung. Each secondary pulmonary lobule is supplied by a branch of the pulmonary artery and is drained by the pulmonary veins. Secondary pulmonary lobules are surrounded by sheaths made of connective tissue, which form three-dimensional structures around the alveoli and airways, which allow the lung to expand in all directions without developing excessive tissue recoil. Stress forces at the alveolar level are transmitted to adjacent alveoli, bronchioles, and ultimately to the visceral pleural surface. Secondary pulmonary lobules can be easily seen on this CT of an adult with emphysema. The respiratory system is histologically complex, with at least 50 distinct cell types which compose the airways. The epithelial cells are incredibly important to both the structure and function of the respiratory system. Nearly half of all epithelial cells contain cilia, which continually move the liquid layer from the most distal airways towards the pharynx, helping to remove foreign material from deep within the lungs. There are also smooth muscle cells, which allow for constriction and relaxation of the airways. Also important are the type 1 and type 2 pneumocytes, which are responsible for gas exchange and the secretion of surfactant, respectively. We will return to the importance of these various cell types in future videos. Cardiopulmonary interactions are complex and have many important implications in respiratory and critical care medicine. They will be discussed in great detail in later videos. However, for our purposes today, it is important to recognize that blood flow to the lungs is supplied by two sources, the bronchial and pulmonary systems. In the pulmonary system, blood flows from the body to the right side of the heart. From there, it courses through the pulmonary arteries to the pulmonary capillaries, where gas exchange takes place at the interface of the alveoli and capillary endothelium. The blood is then drained via the venules and pulmonary veins to the left side of the heart. The bronchial arteries branch off from the thoracic aorta and supply oxygenated blood to the bronchi. Venous blood from the trachea and large airways drains into bronchial venules, forming bronchial veins, and ultimately draining into either the azagous or hemiazagous veins. In the deeper portions of the lung, they anastomose with the pulmonary veins, ultimately draining to the left atrium. This mixing of oxygenated and deoxygenated blood results in the left atrium having a slightly lower oxygen content than the blood in the pulmonary capillary beds. One key difference between these two separate but related sources of blood flow is that while the pulmonary system is under low pressure, the bronchial system, because it comes off of the aorta, is under high pressure. This has important implications for different disease processes which may affect the resistance of pulmonary blood flow. This will be discussed in detail in a later video. To end this section, I would just like to mention a few of the extrapulmonary components of the respiratory system. These are the pleura, the diaphragm, and the chest wall, which is made up of the rib cage and intercostal muscles. These structures play an important role in respiratory mechanics in both health and disease. In this video, we discuss the major anatomic and functional components of the respiratory system including the segmental anatomy of the bronchi and the difference between the conducting zone and the respiratory zone. We also briefly touched on some of the different types of cells and the roles that they play in respiratory mechanics. The topics covered in this video will be important as we begin to focus on different aspects of the lung in both health and disease in greater detail.